Good evening. Welcome to Larry Rinker Golf Live. I'm pleased to be joined by my longtime friend, PGA Tour winner, Mark Weeby. Weebs, great to catch up with you, my friend. You too, Rick. Good to see you, bud. So you've won twice on the PGA Tour, five PGA Tour Champions events, including the 2013 British Open at Royal Birkdale. Hold it. There it is right there. There's the cup. You beat Bernhard Langer in a five-hole playoff. So pretty amazing career you've had, Weebs. And, you know, you've had some injuries, had some health things where you really can't play anymore. You've been doing some teaching. Recently moved to Rio Verde, Arizona, in the Tucson area. Phoenix so, area. Phoenix area. Yeah, Phoenix area. Oh, Phoenix area. Yeah, it's up by the TPC, just north and east of the TPC Scottsdale. Okay. Actually, yeah. So are you able to get out and play at all, or are you just still, you're back well, too uh, bad? Some days I can, some days it's okay. Uh, and I take advantage if I can of those days and try to go out and play a little or hit balls, practice, just do something golf. I kind of miss it. Uh, and then some days I, I can't really take a club out of my bag, let alone raise my arms above my shoulder. And that's, it's all from a neck, uh, nerves with my neck and no complaining. That's the way it is. Uh, and I'm just trying to deal with it. I, you know, it's one of those, I think surgery is required and I feel like I've had enough surgeries to continue playing this game and, and surgery on your neck doesn't sound that great to me. Are you in pain? Uh, sometimes, uh, but not, not now. No, not at all. Uh, there's sometimes that I have a lack of strength. Sometimes there's some discomfort, very seldom is it like a shooting pain or anything. Uh, it's more of, I just can't my, you know, my particular neck, uh, symptoms manifest in my shoulders. So both shoulders, I have a hard time with, and it's all from my neck. Wow. Uh, and I, I had years of neurosurgeons and talking to everybody's got the guy, you know, Hey, I got to see my guy. I can't tell you how many guys I've seen, uh, or girls too, right? Uh, and trying to figure this out, and it's it's just not something that uh, that my symptoms and my issues uh, are going to be. I need more room in my around my spinal cord, basically, and yeah. So when I get to play, it's still cool. I'm I'm still decent, so that's kind of fun. Uh, right. My buddies, you know, they'll call and say, hey, let's go play. And I go, you know, I can't play. It's, I'm going to have to take a few days off. I'm not, it's not working. So, right. uh, and that, like I said, the, the, there's no complaints from me. I, I went as hard as I could for as long as I could. And everything comes to an end sooner or later. Well, you were someone that tried a lot of putters throughout your career. We used to kid you, is this the flavor of the month? What were you really looking for when you were trying these different putters? And what was it about the putter that said, oh, this is the one I'm going to go with? Um, you know, it was, it was loft really determined uh, so much for me and, and how my hands were at impact. It was really not a, a, an address issue. So the guy I worked with, Carl Welty, that really taught me about putting and how to, how to handle the flat stick and, and really become, I, I think a, that's how, why I won. You don't, I didn't win because I hit my driver farther than everybody, you know? Uh, so he just taught me about the, the key things to look for. And as far as optics, I really liked the black white contrast, although I never won a tournament with a black putter with a white line, I, I sure loved that uh, because I worked on a chalk line a lot and I could line up the line on my ping answer two, black ping answer two, I could put that white line on the putter on the white line of the chalk and I could kind of know exactly where I was aiming. So I, 
I, I kind of look for that optically, but loft was a huge issue for, uh, for me to go forward. And it was, we called it dynamic loft. It wasn't loft at address. Uh, it was loft at impact. And sometimes I putted with my hands leading and sometimes I let the putter head swing by. And because of that, my loft changed uh, throughout the year. There were times that I just wasn't into my hands being forward. So I had to putt with a putter with less loft. I think the, the most I ever used was about six degrees, a little over six degrees. Wow. When I really liked my hands forward. Um, and the loft was there so I wouldn't pound the ball into the ground. And right. So um, I was what trying about to- about get... weight? What about the weight or the feel of it and your distance control? Did you play around with that being you know, on faster or slower greens? I only messed with weights of putters um, when I got on the champions tour. Um, I, I never agreed to the lighter putter for fast greens or miss hitting a putt to make it not roll as fast. I, it's too, I work too hard on hitting the ball solid to try right. to miss hit a putt. And I always felt like if I can putt with, I can putt with any putter on any greens, I just need to like, I like, I need to like my putter like it's my buddy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to have quite a few in your garage if you've kept them through the years. You know, I, I have too many. Um, <laughs> I tried to get a lot, when we moved, I really tried to get rid of a lot of my golf stuff because it was older. It's, it, they're more uh, antiques than they are, you know, <laughs> in work right now. Although with putters, Putters, oh my God, sorry about that. Putters, sorry, buddy. That's okay. Um, putters hold their, their, their place in time longer because you can use a putter from 1920 if you could find right. one because they, they, they keep their value and they keep, as long as they make putts, then they're still good, you know? So, uh, right. I do, I try to get rid of a lot. I think my last count was a little over 140 putters. Uh, <laughs> you know, back in the day uh, when we were first on the regular tour, those, the reps would just beg you to take a putter and you would tell them, I'm not gonna use that putter. I'm really gonna use this putter I'm using now. And they said, could you just take it uh, if you might use it sometime? <laughs> and so they would send them to your house and before you know it, well, 20 years on the tour and almost another seven or eight on the champions tour and a little bit of mini tour time before those. And I'm 63. I'm going to have a lot of clubs somewhere. Right. You're going to have a lot of putters. Yeah. Did yeah. you like a line on the putter or no line on the putter? Two balls. I mean, how, what did that help you line up? what did you feel about that? You know, I, uh, I felt that sometimes I loved the line on my putter and then there'd be times that I just didn't want to see the line on my putter. So I would change or I would take out some lead tape and cover the line in the case of the pings. You could, it, since the line was in the cavity, you could kind of bury that. So right. You didn't see it. Um, or an 8802, I went through that time too that I used or an Otto Palmer um, or 8813, those are great putters. They had just such a little line that you never got line uh, weary. You were more into the line was more of the sweet spot of the putter. So right. you weren't you really- You tried the broomstick, didn't you? Tried a long one? Uh, you know, I did. I never could anchor uh, because I tried that and, and I might hit inches behind the ball. <laughs> uh, so I could never do that, but I did find a length that was driver it was about the same length as my driver. And I just held on to it with my left hand and did not want it touching me. Cause like I said, I could, I could hit way behind. Um, and I, I just let it float, but I really putted with my right hand and I'm very right-handed. Right. And in fact, I won five tournaments. All my tournaments were won on the champions tour with the longer putter. Um, and the yes putter, yes, isn't even in business anymore, but great. Great putter, and I had great success with that. Loved that whole, you know, putting is so unique and independent, and 
individual and right. and not really limitless boundaries, but uh, there's a lot of wiggle room as far as claw and cross-handed and a split grip and long and short and arms long and arms bent. And you know, you and I have talked about putting throughout the years that uh, it still intrigues me. And I still, when I teach, I still like to focus on that because it does bleed back through your game. Once you can putt, you become a better chipper automatically. So, right. What do you think when you work with your students, what, what are things that you work on? Cause you're kind of a holistic teacher. I, I don't think you feel like there's one way to do it. You really like working with the student and trying to help them get where they can see the line and hit their line and get their speed. Right. Yes. Uh, well, I think that my favorite teachers throughout my lifetime were ones that said, you know what, let's do what you do and let's just do it really good and stop trying to swing like someone else. And right. I, I just love that approach. And, I, and since golf is such not a generic game and we're, we have so many different builds and heights and flexibilities and uh male and female, junior and senior, you have all of these different categories. So I really try to teach to, if we can discover something or just find something in your swing that is unique, it might be a feel that doesn't show itself on video, yet it's as big as showing itself on video because this, the golfer's feeling that. So if you can if you can learn how to get that feel or if it is a visual that look to your golf swing and then just do it all the time that same that same fingerprint that you have in your golf swing your putting stroke um all of that stuff and you know i try to relate ben crenshaw to a lot of my kids a lot of my juniors the problem is they don't know who ben crenshaw is and it, it makes, <laughs> makes me sad because that's my go-to I mean that that to me is the Ben is is putting to me that's I grew up watching him playing with him playing alongside of him being a competitor but I always paid attention when he had a putter in his hands especially because it was like an artist so who's your top five putters of all time well, you know, I studied so many with Carl uh, throughout the years. Um, Got to love Ben Crenshaw. Just right. love, love the way he putts. Uh, it's hard to not put Tiger up there just because right. of clutch putting. Um, I think Dave Stockton probably is in there close to the top five because of results. Right. He just, he just didn't miss. Just didn't miss. Uh, Jack Nicholas is hard to not put on that. Right. List. You got to put him in. Obviously, I'm not a stroke guy. I mean, there's. I remember Howard Twitty um, and uh, had like the perfect putting stroke. Perfect. It never wavered. It was square throughout the entire stroke. He did all the machines, all the lasers. It was awesome. And George Archer was another one that had like a perfect putting stroke. Right, he was great. Yeah, and I, I don't care about the stroke, I guess, as much as I care about the repetitive, repetitiveness and the key to putting, and good putters know this, you know it already, is, is having your putter meet the ball when it is the face is perpendicular to your intended line. That's all that right. you need to do. So then it becomes, so how do you do that? And then you get into more stroke stuff and length of and, but I still work uh, on my putting. I work in an area, a couple inches in front, a couple inches past the ball. If I get my putter square in a little pocket of time there, and if I aim correctly, I feel like I'm going to probably make most of, most of the putts that are makeable. I, I don't see why I shouldn't, you know. Yeah, you always had a, you were very confident with that club. You all, and I think that's a skill set that every great putter has. You know, some other guys I'd throw in there is Morris Satowski. Totally. Morris Satowski was the 
uh, leading putter the first 10 years, we kept the stats. And then Brad Faxon, obviously. Right. I remember playing with Fax at Riviera after Crenshaw had redone the greens. And they were awful. And Faxon still made everything. I yeah. remember we were playing with Kite, I think. And I'm like, how does he make these putts? And he's like, well, Larry, it's not luck. No. Well, you know, Brad's game, I mean, I, Brad is one of the all-time best putters. I, but this is what I think about that. I think if Brad was a better, more consistent ball striker, he probably wouldn't be as good a putter because he had to call on that as part of his offense. Right. And obviously putting is offense, but he had to call on it as part of his game. Yep. As part of his course management, as part of his game management. He had to call on that to be, and I think he just had some troubles elsewhere um, and he is a great putter and when he hit it he hit it as good as anybody else when he was on but when he was off it I think it became hard to play golf where you have to make everything to you know right. equal or better par do you feel like you tweaked your swing that much throughout your career or do you feel like you kind of stayed pretty much in a similar box and just worked on certain fundamentals that worked for you in your game that's a great question, bud. Uh, you know, I, I didn't tweak much. I mean, I, I'd always want to get better, but the, you know, the fundamentals for me were grip, posture, alignment, and then some kind of rhythm, depending on what, what music you wanted to listen to that day, kind of, sort of. Uh, but I, I always, I mean, Carl also instilled that in me that, you know, if this is how you do it, if, if this is how your body works and this is your swing. And I think the comment I got was, Oh, you're coming over the top. And okay. If you do it all the time, every time, Jim Furyk, Raymond Floyd, Nancy Lopez. I, I mean, the list is forever. Right. Uh, if you do it the same way all the time, you're going to be pretty good. So right. finding that place that you're comfy and, and you feel you can repeat is that groove that people talk about. Now, there are some teachers that refuse to believe that and will have heated arguments for sure. <laughs> uh, they believe, no, the swing must be this way. And this is, right. your forearms have to rotate at a, you know, yada, yada. And I, I just go, okay, okay, that's cool. Just not my way. Well, if you got a little too much over the top, felt like you're swinging a little too much left, you probably worked a little more and feeling a little more in to out with your swing, didn't you? Well, for me, I would actually go and try to hit start right draws. Right. So instead of now, some people, David Frost is a great example. He's more of a swing technician and I wasn't, but I could go to try to hit hooks and that would get me more. That or, fix your swing. Yes. It would get me less steep and down and more uh, more out and and space. But that's old school. That's the way we would fix it. If we were, if our body rotation got ahead of our arms and hands and we were kind of blocking it to the right, we'd go hit hooks. Right. And, well, and then if I started hooking it too much, I'd hit cuts. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, I remember listening to Tom Weiskopf uh, speak at one of the college tournaments that I played in way back at San Jose State. And he talked about how golf is for players. And he said, it's almost like that sprinkler that you see on a golf course that makes its way across slow little jitter bugging. And it's got this wide expanse and it finally gets to the one place. And then it starts all the way back at the beginning again. And he said, faders get aiming too far left and hookers get aiming too far right. And God, if that doesn't just sum it up. Right? No, that, that's it. That's it. So that's why those fundamentals are so important. And, uh, you know. But knowing no your swing and not really going off the cliff of trying to reinvent yourself like I did or trying to find something different that, you know, and just instead of just tweaking your swing, Johnny Miller talked about it, neutralizing out his swing. You know, right. He used to work on hitting low, me, medi, medium, 
high trajectory cuts, straight shots and hooks. He said, I had nine shots. And he said, a lot of times I had four that were working pretty good of the nine. And if one was choking, I could go to the other one. Right. Without a doubt. And I, I do think we're missing that in our youth. I really do. And, yeah. Uh, I, that's probably where I feel like I, I can help the most is, is give our kids a little of the old school. They need a little bit. They need to get away from numbers. Numbers are great. TrackMan's great. Flight scope, all the, those are all right. awesome. And they all tell the tale. It's all great. Nothing wrong with that. I still like to see the ball fly. Right. And if I totally. want to go from right to left, I don't care what those numbers say. I want to see, I want to see that because that's how I got my trust. I think it's how you got your trust to go to the golf course and be able to aim down that left side of out of bounds, knowing you could fade it back. Right. Or vice versa. So right. I, I do think we're lacking a little bit of that. And we get into I, I watch these juniors that are really good golfers and then they all of a sudden break and they don't just shoot 72 or three or four, they shoot 85 to 90. Yeah. These are great, really good junior golfers. And it's because when they're broken, they don't know what to do when it. No, they don't know how to find their way home. And that's really what I work with on my students is, okay, you hit that ball to the right. What caused it? What's the fix? Yeah. You have to know it. Yes. And mm -hmm. if you don't know it, and we've all been lost out on the golf course and not knowing what the fix is, and golf's no fun when you're there. No. And that, that the thing is that we have been through that, and we're trying to save some other, especially juniors. I think I'm fond, not everybody, but I really do enjoy the juniors because it's, it's more of a blank slate that you can just add to instead of having to erase some stuff and then right. rewrite some wording or get rid of that move and try to get this move in. That's hard. But right. when you're a kid, uh, a junior, that's, you know, I think we can, we help. I just feel like I'm, I can help more in that. Well, Gunner, your son, he's what, 30, 31 now? Gunner's 31. Yeah. Yeah. Same age as my oldest, Devin. He's playing professional golf. He's been, playing the mini tours like you and I did before we got our tour card. So how's he doing? Well, it's just, there's, you know, the old saying of you find it in the dirt, you go out and hit and you figure it out, you know, and it's sometimes that road is a long road and bumpy. And then you have a couple smooth parts and you think, ha oh, ha you know, I'm, I'm kind of almost a Shangri-La there for a yeah. second. So. I played with Rob Oppenheim on Tuesday. He played at Rollins. I worked with him when he was in college. My marching orders were I couldn't change his swing, which was pretty good marching orders. Right. And so I just helped him understand how his swing worked. And I mean, he played great. He's hitting it, got 60 yards by me at least. Right. Uh, and he's got about 112 mile per hour club head speed, which is a little low not quite tour average, but pretty cl close enough. And he just played great golf. And it was just amazing watching him. I, I just can't believe how far the young guys are hitting it. And 20 years ago when I worked with him, I, he maybe hit it 10 yards by me. So I was, I was a lot younger and he, was, he wasn't as strong as he is now. But it's amazing how far, I bet Gunner pounds it out there. Yeah, I mean, it's all... It's all, I mean, equipment has so much to do with all of this and youth and coming in in the next generation, just like our generation, I'm sure hit it past those before us. Right. And then our, the generation behind us, of course, is going to pass us. And at the same time, we have this equipment that's going out of the, out of this world, uh, balls, clubs, shafts materials i mean my god yeah you know. what i can't believe weaves when i go to bay hill every year is i two things i can't believe how fast the whole swing is and i can't believe how high they hit it yeah those are the but, two things i see but that's the game today and right. 
Right. But if you asked, uh, and there's a lot of great players. Yeah. They have learned how their pocket of their, their trajectory. Right. The launch angle. And they know that they've, uh, by machines, they know they're getting the absolute most out of this club because the numbers don't lie. They tell you. The problem is when the wind blows into your face and, and you like sliding the ball down a little because the wind's in your face, I don't think a lot of the players can do that. I don't think they quite understand that that's part of golf because to be a good driver, it's not just getting the perfect driver that fits your body and swinging as hard as you can. It's about hitting hooks and slices and lows and highs. And yeah, that's why you love seeing them play the old courses where they have to do that, whether it's Colonial or Hilton Head or right. golf courses that are under 7,000 yards. Right. And now all of a sudden you got to shape shots. And, you know, you have a ball that doesn't want to shape very much, doesn't like curving you have clubs that don't really curve the ball very much. So it's kind of a, it's a weird time to watch because you, and then you have DeChambeau just yeah. 400 and some yards. I mean, it's golf's in this really weird time and it's super circus. Like it always has been great entertainment. Um, but every hole still ends with a putt. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> nobody's <laughs> going to play without a putter, but people could play without a driver. Right. Yes. And it's DeChambeau's done something nobody's ever done. He's not only picked up 50 yards and 20 miles per hour club head speed, but he's hit it straight. Yeah. And you and I both, without mentioning names, we had friends that said, I can't compete unless I can hit it 10 or 20 yards further. And the next thing you know, they couldn't, they couldn't right. play golf anymore. Right. They, they went to change their swing to get there, but you know, it's, it's an interesting game, and I think all of us have to find our own swings. I think we all have to find our own putting strokes. I, I, I don't think any two putting strokes are the same. I don't either, and the, the older I get, the more my belief gets larger in that area, just because and if you just watch, you don't need machinery. <laughs> I don't need numbers to be right. read on putting. I, you know. I know. Well, one thing, the one thing that gets me is, uh, you know, we have great putters that were left aimers, great putters that are right aimers, and everybody's trying to zero it out, and we've got to aim perfectly, and that means I need a stroke that returns it, but it's kind of grandpa's gun. Yes. Grandpa's gun shoots a little high right, so I, I learn how to aim a low left and hit the target. Right. And I think great putters learned how to aim their strokes when they were kids. Well, Billy Wood, left aimer, Dave Stockton, left aimer, Jack Nicholas, left aimer, Tiger Woods, right aimer, Brad Faxon, right aimer. Right. Uh, so it's, I didn't even know I was a right aimer until I got measured and found out what my numbers were. But I didn't really need to know, did I? No. I mean, I guess if your mind works that way, then yes. But I, I think if you don't, know that you'll figure it out it's it's in wow i keep missing my ball a little to the right Maybe yeah aim a little more to the left right right it's not that hard no but it's we not that hard all of our teaching it it wants you to think it's super hard so you could come back to me for a lesson i'm trying to do what what i did especially to the kids nowadays is <laughs> My teachers tried to teach me so I could fix myself while I was playing. They didn't try to fix me good right. enough to come back the next week. And what a skill set to be able to fix yourself when you're playing. Oh my gosh. And and to realize it and to not yeah. have too big of an ego and and realize score. It's all about score. It's all about score. Right. Why'd you lay up on that par five? Well, it was really I'm not hitting my three wood very good and it required a really good three wood. Right. Well, what do you mean? Well, if I lay up, I have a wedge in it. I'm really good with my wedges. So right. I don't need to hit. I don't need to go risk reward on this. Right. When I, when I, it's not that big of a reward because I'm going to get it up and down anyway, probably from yeah. 80. So, well, you're going to hit it close. You're going to have an opportunity and you take right. six out of the equation. Well, yes. we're out of time. It's always great to catch up with you, my friend. You too, buddy. Uh, I remember meeting you in Vegas, Texas Dolly. 
Wow. Uh, you know, and, uh, that part, that part's in my new book, The Journey, man. Hopefully you got this in the mail. I haven't got it yet, but I'm looking yet, for it. But it should, it should be coming, but uh, you're in the book and, you know, it's, it's really about what we went through and our journey and, you know, congrats, man. You won twice on the tour. I remember when you won at the SAS, your first tournament, you were not an exempt player on the Champions Tour. You're going to be a Monday qualifier and you win the first event. And then you go on to have this incredible Champions Tour career, winning five times and the crown jewel of winning the Senior Open Championship, beating Bernhard Langer. I mean, holy cow, bud. You got that cup right there behind you over your right shoulder. That's pretty neat. Thanks, buddy. It is cool. I walk by it every day. Yeah. Well, I can only imagine what you have drank out of that cup. Oh, you know what? It's a nice variety. It's a good bouquet <laughs> of different liqueurs. Yeah. Yes. All right, Weebs. Thanks. All right, buddy. Thanks for listening to Larry Rinker Golf Live. We're on Thursdays, 738 on Facebook. Till next week, keep swinging.